When Oscar Wilde was being in the cell, uh, pretty much the, the same basic size. There would have been uh, in the corner there a, a porcelain toilet. There would have been a bed, but it would have been a bare bed, usually with a, a basic mattress and, and his blankets folded up during the day, laid out in the evening. And of course the walls would have been bare, down to the bare brick. The bars in the window would have been there, they're quite new. It would have been a, a stone glass clad window. By the door, the only lighting that he would have had would have been a, a simple mm. gas flame. And would he have been allowed to bring books and things in, or were prisoners allowed to have any kind of personal ornaments or anything like Almost that? Almost certainly not. It was a very austere regime. Uh, I believe the stories, and many people speak about what happened at the time, that there was a warder who did bring books into him, and he was castigated by the governor for doing that. Different times to today. It's said sometimes now that if you're a working man, you might possibly survive a sentence for hard labour, but if you were from what was known as the gentleman class, it was as good as a death sentence. Oh, very, very much so, as it, as it is today. I mean, people are, are sort of bred into prison, so to speak. I mean, for a gentleman to come into a prison today would be harsh. At that time, it would have been very much harsher. The governor of Reading said that he was going to knock the nonsense out of Wilde. So the poet who had once given his profession as idleness was set to work on the treadmill and the crank. This was where Oscar discovered that life does not imitate art and that the reality of a prison sentence was a million miles away from the ivory tower of martyrdom which he had previously assumed it to be. And yet, dramatically, Oscar's time in prison did serve as the perfect fourth act to the self-scripting tragedy which his life had become. Initially denied writing materials, Oscar eventually found release and some expression in writing letters, most notably to Lord Alfred Douglas, his letter De Profundis. You could say that prison gave Wilde a kind of lucidity. And ironically, perhaps one of the greatest paradoxes of all, it was in prison that he did his best writing. One of the things Wilde wrote was that prison doesn't break your heart, it turns it to stone. Society often forgives the criminal, it never forgives the dreamer. One of the many lessons we learn in prison is that things are what they are and will be what they will be. By falling from the heights, Oscar discovered that his real fans were those who sympathised with his fall. Prison would finish the man, but forge the legend. On his release from Reading, Wilde was forced abroad by his reputation, and after drifting around Europe, finally settled in Paris. I think it's very hard to imagine precisely what it was like to be well in Paris in his last year and a half. Partly because, although he was very famous, this was obviously a pre-television age, so he couldn't assume that he would be recognised. But he was famous enough, and society was small enough, the kind of society that moved between Paris and London, for him always to have the ever-present danger of there being someone who would see him. And his assumption was, usually rightly, sadly, that if they saw him, they would make a fuss. So he tended to leave restaurants if he heard an English accent, because he didn't want the humiliation for himself, or for them, just the whole scene, basically. Um, and, of course, he was on a, <clears throat> what would be called today, a downward spiral of absence and so on, which I gather is pretty lethal stuff. You're too old to lose it Too young to choose it And the clock waits so patiently on your song You walk past the cafe But you don't eat this is the hotel room in Paris where Oscar died in 1900, just two years after he was released from Reading Jail. 
This is the bed in which he died. Shift breaks the snarling as to stumble across the road. But the day breaks instead, so you hurry. But like all messiahs, Oscar has now been resurrected. Damned at his trial as the pederastic high priest of decadence, whose life, no less than his works, was a byword for iniquity, his influence was blamed for sapping the strength of English youth, to the point that some of his detractors would even welcome World War I as a specific purge for Wildean decadence, which is a bit like blaming Duran Duran for the recession. By the late 1950s, we showed sympathy for his downfall. In the 1960s, he was up there with Che Guevara as a countercultural icon. Now, in the heritage-hungry 1990s, he enjoys the secular canonization of a full-length costume drama feature film. Don't let the sun blast your shadow. But however acceptable he might seem today, Oscar won't be the saint that we'd like him to be. He'd find such a role both vulgar and dull. And this is why he matters, and why his life and work comprise a classic manifesto for free thought and disaffection. Oscar authorised a way of life for the generations who followed, and perhaps the best executives of his legacy are all of those people who feel that they're somehow different, who don't want any trouble, but would go down fighting to defend their right to be different. Their right to be different, after all, is everyone's right. I think what's important about Wild is the almost in your face, this is me, this is what I am. There is no half measure. It's all there. It's quite obvious what I am. It's obvious what I represent. You can like it or you cannot like it, but I'm not going to change. I mean, that sort of thing is... It's almost punk, isn't it? It's almost like... We hate everyone. <laughs> I think the fact that Oscar Wilde still matters proves that that afternoon in the Cadogan Hotel, Oscar Wilde made the right decision. Of course, he was a brilliant playwright, and the four major plays that he wrote, are, some of them, I think, are in London at the moment. But, but the fact is, it's the myth that fascinates us about Oscar Wilde, and it's the icon of him that fascinates us, and it's the, the tragic downfall that fascinates us. The, the writing is really only a part of the, of the Oscar Wilde story, and it's the tragic downfall from someone who was so... who had this imperial sense of um, that everything he, he, he would do would, would turn right, would, would fascinate people. Well, I think that to typify Wilde from our perspective as a gay hero is to do him a disservice. He was a hero to humanity. He's really the first existentialist, in a way, because Genet and Sartre and these people uh, tried to uh, basically enable people to live their lives as they wanted to. Uh, and as they were, as people freed from the restrictions of religion or race or culture, and Wilde did that. The gods had given me almost everything. I had genius, a distinguished name, high social position, brilliancy, intellectual daring. I made art a philosophy, and philosophy an art. I altered the minds of men and the colour of things. There is nothing I said or did which did not make people wonder. I treated art as the supreme reality and life as a mere mode of fiction. I awoke the imagination of my century so that it created myth and legend around me. I summed up all systems in a phrase and all existence in an epigram. The life and work of Salvador Dali is featured in next week's Omnibus on Monday at 10.40. Meanwhile, BBC One's Oscar Wilde theme continues tomorrow. The picture of Dorian Gray. Bye.